Ross Ulbricht is serving a double life sentence without parole for all nonviolent charges for creating a website. Please help free this peaceful man. Go to freeross.org and sign and share the petition. So it's little wonder that smart shoppers everywhere take time out to pause and refresh. And where else but in the fountain where they serve ice cold Coca Cola? The E-Militia Podcast, Episode 35, What is Agorism, with Car Campet, Sal the Agorist, and Alex Utopium. Enjoy, fuckers. Well, uh, welcome to another episode of the E-Militia Podcast. Today we've got Alex Utopium, Anglo, Bloody, Car, Empress of Meme, and Sal. And we have Craig, the recording bot, in here in the Discord app, and we're ready to bring you some <laughs> agorism tips. Uh, again, this is the E Militia Podcast, episode one oh eight, and uh, I'll right. hand it over to you, buddy. Man, that was so professional and so and confident. Yeah, it, it's it's really nice that you presume we're going to last more than a hundred episodes. So uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, you just did. That, that, that was really that was really generous <laughs> of you. We're going to have to wait. That's my gift to you. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's like seventy more episodes before we can release this shit. Um, you should do, you should do episode one oh nine next. <laughs> and just roll with it. Confuse the <laughs> fuck out of everyone. I, I like it. I like it. Just just legitimize ourselves by fake fake it till we make it. Uh, yeah, and if anybody posts about it, just respond with the SEK picture. Yeah. <laughs> no, no questions, please. Moving moving on. Um, <laughs> no further questions, Your Honor. So uh, yeah, <laughs> this episode we're going to be um, covering the basic sort of uh, agorism one hundred and one or agorism, depending on how European you are. Um, I Angler, how do you say it? Agorism, agorism. Agorism, because it's an agora in the Greek word that it comes from, not agora. Ah, uh, well, I guess I've been uh, I've been Americanized. I, I've been reading it as agorism for like a year or so. so now I'm stuck saying it, that uh, I'm a bad Brit. Um, oh, but uh, Brit. <laughs> I, I, I guess a good start would be um, so everyone, all of our guests today are uh, well versed in agorism. Um, how long would you guys say you've been? Um, would you guys label yourselves? Uh, Agorists, or would you use something else? Like Alex, what, what would you call yourself? If there is one label, then then it's uh, <laughs> agorism for sure. Yes. It does, doesn't feel dorky saying it. <laughs> and uh, how long would you say you've been um, sort of following uh, these principles? Uh, by accident for about 15 years. <laughs> but on, on purpose for about four. I was, I was practicing it um, without knowing the philosophy behind it. Sometimes it's the best way, just stumble into it and learn as you go. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Didn't it get you into some legal trouble recently? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the third time. This is this has been a serious, most serious time. Um, what happened? Uh, the state uh, dropped the case. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's um, that's was... ending. That's ending. We can, <laughs> we can take yeah. the beginning uh, at the, later in the job. Gotcha. Um, Carl, how about yourself? Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I think amongst uh, people that understand what it is, I'm, that's probably the most accurate label f- for me. But otherwise, I'd just say libertarian. Um, yep. I um, just property rights, you know, self ownership and property rights. Um, I've been a libertarian uh, of some sort for, geez, uh, I guess twelve or thirteen years, um, and I've, I would say that I've 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 really leaned into the agorist thing in the last, I don't know, maybe since two thousand fourteen or so. Damn. People were still recovering from uh, Ron Paul, and you're you're out here doing doing the hardcore stuff. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I was necessarily doing the hardcore stuff. I think you know, honestly, I think w- what happened was I was recovering from Ron Paul, and I was like, man, I cannot go through that heartbreak again. Is there another solution? You know? <laughs> yeah, no, right on. And that's uh, that's actually something I, I believe one of the topics we're going to be getting into partyarchy, but we'll uh, we'll touch on that. Um, Sal, how about yourself? You know, same thing. Um, I've been an on purpose agorist for probably like seven or eight years. And kind of like, just like Carr said, I was like so disgusted after Ron Paul that I was like, well, what is the solution? And then that's when I found like Bitcoin and 3D printing. And I met some people at Porkfest and, 
you know, here we are today. Nice. I mean, as you can uh, as you can tell, ladies and gentlemen, we've got uh, a bit more of an experienced uh, heavy guess. hitters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, usually Emp's the uh, the the veteran of this community in this chat, but um, yeah, tonight we've got some people who've been uh, doing this a lot longer than uh, all of our regular hosts. So uh, yeah, be doing some learning. Um, yeah, where can we find you, people, before we jump into this uh, <laughs> into the, the the heavy topics? <laughs> Alex. Social media, where you do your writing, projects um, you're working on. I'm um, mostly hanging on Twitter, and my at there is Utopian Tinkerer. And I have a personal blog on utopian.blog, which is mostly book reviews and very little politics nowadays. But it, it used to be <clears throat> a lot. But I shifted over to newlibertarian.io, for the, mostly for the politics, or for the agorist part, at least. Mm-hmm. So my blog right now is just book reviews and nerdy plant pictures. <laughs> I'm Car, and uh, I've got a rec volleyball team that uh, is advancing <laughs> towards the playoffs. So I'll keep everyone abreast of that on my Twitter account at Car Campit. And then oh. uh, I've also got oh shit, my speaker just uh, unplugged, so I don't know if I was doubling over anybody. I've got to figure this out. Somebody else go. <laughs> right. um, Sal, where can we find you? Um, I'm at, I think I'm at Sally Mayweather. I don't even know, to be honest with you, but um, <laughs> I'm also writing at NewLibertarian.io, and I've got the Agora podcast, and, you know, the usual stuff. And uh, we'll be linking all of that in the show notes. You can find all these lovely people. I just, like, complete, did I completely barge over somebody? No. No? No, you were oh, good. okay. My speaker, like, shut off, and I, I didn't hear anybody, so I just kind of started going. Anyway. Oh, so, no, you were <laughs> Everybody's done. It's, you can finish. I think you have a... A dumb podcast or something? Yeah, yeah, pretty dumb one. Yeah, Friends Against <laughs> Government. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at FagCast and listen to us on all your podcasters, all your dumb podcasters. And, uh, <laughs> are you plugging that camping thing you guys do? Or, uh... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're doing a camping thing uh, down in Austin, Texas, May 23rd to 26th. It's Childerberg. Go to Childerberg.com or go bug Jacob Lindsay from Tasting Anarchy <laughs> uh, about details and not me. So don't direct any of that to me, please. <laughs> You heard it here first, folks. Uh, bug car exclusively. Um, and only car. Before we get into the party stuff, I'm kind of curious how everybody found Konkin's material or agorism. Like what your first introduction to that was? I don't even remember, to be honest with you. I just, you know, there's like such a like diverse array of libertarian writers. You know, I guess I'm still trying to work my way through all of them. And I guess somewhere along the way, I must have encountered Konkin. And I really just felt like he was like the pinnacle of logical consistency. Like I felt like I finally like figured it out once I like read the New Libertarian Manifesto. But I have no idea, to be honest with you, how I <laughs> came across that. I I think I agree with Sal. I'm not really sure. I I would I would wonder if like somebody relatively big back in those days did a podcast on it or something like that. And Sal and I both heard it. Uh, but I don't I don't really remember a defining moment. I remember reading the New Libertarian Manifesto and being like, wow, this is. You know, this is like a little bit different than most other writing, not in that, not that it was like, you know, beautiful prose or anything like that necessarily, although I think he's a good writer, but I, I was like, this, this is like really kind of a, a an a, attack manual of sorts. Going beyond sort of uh, the principles and ideas and more into like something you can actively do today. Yeah. Yeah. And that always appealed to me because I was always a little bit more like, that's just appeals to me a lot more than, than, um, well, I mean, for sure politics, but even like. I mean, it sounds weird to say, but like reading and writing and stuff like that, I, I, I mean, I want to read enough to like get a functional understanding of something. And then I'm a lot of times I'm kind of done with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people from your, uh, your uh, radio episode you do with us are, are going to get that, you know, you're a, uh, you want to be hands on actually getting something done. Yeah. And I, I think that frustration is true of uh, a lot of people in our community today, especially the, uh, the younger people. Like you tell them it's a, it's a marathon and not a sprint. And they're like, uh, that's why we've got this kind of boogaloo, um, you know, thing going on where people are like, well, I want it now. It's like, well, mm. uh, there's there's a better way to do it now. You know, so mm-hmm. that, that's why I think this is going to be a important discussion for uh, that kind of crowd. Um, Alex, how about yourself? How did you come across uh, Konkin? I have a friend who is my tech guy. Who, uh, nice. uh, g- gave me a copy of uh, New Libertarian Manifesto, which is a science copy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh well. <wow. laughs> and. Uh, he he gave it to me as a Christmas gift. 
four, four or five years ago. And then I read it the year after. And then I was sold. I was like, yep, this is it. Game over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, especially if you were already getting yourself in trouble uh, accidentally practicing uh, agoristic Yeah, stuff. exactly. It's, <laughs> it's, like, it's oh, nice this, to have this... some lore to go with your shenanigans, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, no, no, no. What you're doing is legit. <laughs> exactly. There's a whole philosophy behind it. <laughs> like, oh, oh, sweet. And... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing quite like legitimacy. Um... No, no, no. I'm not, a, I'm not a criminal. I'm doing this for moral reasons. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's political. Damn it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, that's a very unromantic way <laughs> in, but it is it is what it is. Sometimes I, I'm so jealous of Americans who have uh, Ron Paul and that sort of movement going on. Us Europeans, are, I don't know how it is for you guys, who, you're British, but uh, in Sweden, libertarian isn't in a, even a thing. We, we use liberal for the same thing. Uh, I think Brits just really, really violently stumble into into libertarianism. Like it's a complete freak accident. Like you already have to be thinking kind of you have to be kind of a broken Brit. <laughs> like I was I just <laughs> happened I happened to be really into shooting, like in a and believed in fundamental gun rights in a way that like is not prevalent in British culture and that kind of just snowballed into uh into coming to everything else. And, yeah. and like looking into US politics and then you learn about libertarianism rather than having like a or yeah, even friends that would be into it. You have to be absolutely dispossessed with the entire political <laughs> system in this country and think, what the fuck is going wrong? And then look into it further. There's nobody around to tell you. That yeah, you're like, option. am I nuts? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you think you're actually a fucking psychopath. Uh, being European is fun, people. It's like, just. It's basically a disease. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> being an anarchi anarchist is more common in Europe than uh, being a libertarian. Yeah, At for real. In my experience. Yeah, and then they're yeah, like, so... Uh, Let's put the capitalists up against the wall, and you're like, uh... <laughs> please don't. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, not sure about that one. <laughs> Can we go back a few steps? I, I feel like we had a neat transition into patriarchy, and then I kind of lost it. <laughs> Do all of you vote? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Uh, what's everyone's opinion on voting? Sal just vomits in the background. <laughs> <laughs> right, I didn't bring enough whiskey. <laughs> yeah, so, so did. It, does anyone still vote at all? No shame? Oh, no, 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 no. I haven't voted in a long, long time. Yeah, uh, car, yeah car, no. Alex? I voted once in 2004. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. 2004, that was forever ago. Never mind. Yep. And I did it for man. a very, very Cancels. silly reasons. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the last time, uh, I know the last time I voted was Brexit. Um, I think Anglo might be the same. Uh, yeah, that's right. I, d I did go to the last general election with just to write taxation theft on the ballot card in the hopes <laughs> that one person reads it and goes, hang on a fucking minute. Yeah, I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if they're volunteering the time to count votes, they're probably a lost cause, but you know. I know. <laughs> Still had ballot cards here that you could write stuff on, then I would go. Uh, <laughs> just, to, just to maybe like fuck with one single person like Angler said. Yeah, it's, it's worth my two minutes to fuck someone <laughs> Um, I, haven't, I haven't voted in quite a while, but you could could vote for me last general election in Norway, and four people did. That was hey. <laughs> awesome. That's, that's did you get on a ballot or something? Yes, for the Capitalist Party of Norway. Nice. <laughs> that's, that's the equivalent of uh, your Libertarian Party, right? Uh, it, it is the Libertarian Party, but yes. in, uh, in no Norwegian, they call it Liberalistena, mm. and in... Uh, and when they present themselves in English, they present themselves as the Capitalist Party. For some reason, I have no idea why. But <laughs> Norwegians are Is it also run by a CIA agent? <laughs> <laughs> like, we'll eventually turn Norway. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a matter of time. Yeah. We got 0.2% last election, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. like, we're almost there. That's about what the LP gets here. <laughs> are, you a, are you a voter car? A voter? Is that what you just said? Yeah. Uh, one uh, one no, of them voting no, folks. No, no, I'm not. I, but I also just don't think it matters. Like, I, I think some people have are under this like impression that if nobody voted, like the government would just uh, disappear, and I, I just don't think that's the case. So I, I don't honestly, I just don't, I don't really think about voting any all that much anymore. It's, I think it's just kind of like an exercise in futility, one way or the other. So I don't, you know, I don't vote, but I don't, I frankly don't give much of a shit if somebody else does because that government's still going to be there. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty spot on. What do we all think about libertarians who focus on party politics? And I've, I've read, I've read Sal's right up, so I know it's coming. But um, what what does everyone think about uh, people who participate in the LP, even in like uh, you know uh, so called radical caucuses? Uh, I actually think like I, I think most people probably think this is a little, probably wouldn't agree with me, but I think that a lot of those sorts of operations are like. I think a lot of times are the feds they're like undercover and they're trying to get people to behave in like an inefficient way. Like they want us to fight back in a way that they know that they're going to win so that they try to like funnel us into the trap of party politics, which they know that, you know, we don't stand a chance of ever achieving any bit of change whatsoever. So I actually think it's like malicious. That's, a, that's interesting. I'm oddly enough. I'm not sure if I've ever thought about it like that, but that's an interesting point. Like they're, they're luring you to fight their battle. Like, rather than you fighting yours. Right, right. And also, if, like, if you think about, like, the, what the FEC is, like, from, like, a purely yeah. economic, like, standpoint, it's just a cartel. And sure, really, yeah, they, I mean, obviously, They've yeah. just, just yeah. cartelized, like, the red market. So, like, there's no way they're going to allow a competitor into mm-hmm. the red market, nor should any libertarian want to compete in the red market, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah I mean, that's an interesting point, for sure. Yeah, like, wait, just wasting, wasting people's time rather than... Um, you know, do, you imagine something if, that... like, um, I think like the example I, I usually like to throw at people is like, imagine if Cody Wilson was like canvassing his local neighborhood for the LP I... for Gary Johnson, rather than writing up like STL files, like that would suck, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, I guess the counterpoint would be, and I don't know which side I fall on, but I, I like your point. Um, the counterpoint would be, what if there's a guy that what wasn't particularly good at CAD, but was good at canvassing. And then he found Cody Wilson, you know? Right. Right. I don't know. Yeah, it's a tough. It's a tough. It's like a. You don't need a political system to find Cody Wilson, right? You need. You need some. Well, I mean, I don't know that. You, I hope that you don't need one, but I mean, I guess it, it. It certainly. It sounds like a lot of people, like with Ron Paul, they, they, they did, and I know that's like kind of like a, a hobby horse. Everybody oh, yeah, gets up yeah. on myself included, but um, fra- f- frankly, it just. I mean, it, it is the case. Like it, it brought an enormous amount of attention. So, I don't know. It's a. That's a. It's a. For me, yeah, it's just like. Thing. Like a Go lot ahead. of times, like when people, when people say like, oh, well, Ron Paul, Ron Paul, my whole thing is like, so if the whole point of the party, party archy is to serve as a platform, then nowadays we have ways of doing so that are more consistent with the non-aggression principle, like start a podcast or start a YouTube channel or start a blog, like don't run for office and try to steal my rights and steal my money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can't in- increase my liberty by stealing my, my paycheck. <laughs> that, well that's a really good point i don't know if anybody else has, has a similar experience but the libertarian party is incredibly small in this uh country of of mine and i've gone to a few meets of theirs recently and pretty much everyone there is an ancap but they run for a political party those are usually the ones who are ripe for conversion though well they, they shouldn't need converting anymore they're they're anarchists but they put so much time and effort into trying to get inside a system that they are never going to be in and even if they were they'd be completely contradicting their principles because even if they do manage to reduce tax a little bit they're still collecting tax from people while acknowledging the taxation is theft for sure um, for sure definitely i i asked i asked them about it and their argument was yeah but if you can help people become a little bit more free then good on you, but the, it's just such a fucking futile effort. That yeah, I think you you said like the Norwegian party got zero point zero two percent of the votes. <sighs> Ours would come nowhere even close to that. That would be a good bloody election if they managed to get that sort of result. So what? Is that even a full Norwegian person? How many people are in Norway? <laughs> <laughs> Half a Norwegian. He voted for the liberty, like the capitalist party, and then also like the liberals. Sorry everyone I'm, I'm really lost it was alex Carr that <laughs> voted for him so where'd you guys finish off i'm sorry i had to walk away from my computer well, i don't i don't know this is what we need br for the little shit i guess um i just want you guys want to assign you guys want to assign me transitions from here on out i can just take it yes but i do just, have just, an actual just, real just, good yeah, question like a, all right okay how do you guys feel about anarcho-zionism compared to partyarchy you know like free state project is that what that's called like anarcho zionism yeah that's what konkin calls it like anarcho zionism what's he call it that i don't think i've ever heard that or i just forgot it kibbutz are well are some kind of uh anarcho zionism i guess i think he got it from there i'm not 100 percent sure just totally dropping the ball on uh my sek facts yeah there's a whole 
thing. Essay on it. There's a lot of places where small spots of anarchism, like the Zapatista in Mexico has some land as well, I guess. Yeah, there's, um, there's, there's quite that's... a lot of places in Mexico that are just like villages that are completely out, that have no government and they work yeah, totally so fine. Just to throw out the so... trials <laughs> and, the, and the police. So, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't Spain have like a, a fair amount of communities that, that kind of isolate themselves a little bit? Catalan or Catalan or however you pronounce it. Uh, uh, Catalonia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So is that, that a worthy effort or what? Is that, what? is that a worthy effort or what? Worth the time? Oh, well, I mean, they lost the civil war, but I mean, they've more. Or less, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to study it more. I, maybe Sal knows more about it, or, or somebody else. But I, I, I worthy. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's ever not worthy uh, to to give it a go. I guess, but um, they certainly are still owned and regulated by the country of Spain. But I think they are afforded. I think isn't Catalonia kind of a little bit of an autonomous region to some extent? Mm, no, <laughs> not really. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> They wish y'all, y'all would know. Y'all would know better than uh, me. There is, there is, there is, there is, um, there is a bit of a tear in the social fabric there because Madrid is the capital of Spain, and but Barcelona is was the, I think it was uh, the capital of Catalonia. It's considered now at least to be the capital of Catalonia, and around the area where Catalonia is, is the productive part of the country, and Madrid is screwing it over all the time. By with political uh, resolutions, so they had the option of having one port in Barcelona or one in Madrid. Uh, the Spanish government chose Madrid because they are there. <laughs> mm-hmm. So there is a lot of economic stuff going on. So well, in um, in the Catalonia's eyes, the Madridians are just sucking up resources, and they Barcelona doesn't doesn't need them. Madrid need them. So it's just a political struggle there. And so the Catalonian president uh, had to escape to, they they elected a president and wanted to separate from uh, Spain. But the Spanish government said yes, no. (laughs) And then all the separatists had to uh, escape the country. I don't know how many of them got arrested, but one, the the president had to escape to Germany. I'm not sure if he's still there, but he should be that's the problem with anarcho-zionism because that's what that's what they're going to do to anybody who makes any significant progress uh they're just going to arrest them or even worse we'll do what lincoln did and just genocide you so i i, I think mean, it i mean i think the exact words that Konkin said i think was that it, it depended on the i think he said it depended on like the, the moral restraint of politicians who don't have any so i i think counter economics really is the only possible path forward yeah, because uh, the, the Catalonians tried to play by the state's game. They had a vote for independence, and next thing you know, there's cops in riot gear dragging people out of voting booths. I mean... Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. It's crazy. It's, it's not, yeah, yeah. Like, you're not going to get any sort of uh, fair fair game when you play the game they want you to play, as you as you said with the uh, the parties, uh, Sal. So, I... But that I, it brings me into this pragmatic school of thought where it's like, not everyone's going to be your hardcore agorist as much as we want them to be. Some people will unfortunately get stuck in the, the status mentality in the, the furthest they might go. And, and this is where Sal's going to want to headbutt me potentially <laughs> is, uh, is, is where like the furthest someone will go is participating in, in their libertarian party is doing the, the door to door knocking or, or even um, in their minds doing the quote, quote radical thing and trying to, um, create an example of a uh, a governmentless society and uh, within a, a government controlled state. And um, I, I I guess what I'm trying to get at is, do you guys think that's a complete waste of time, or do you think there's something valiant to uh, to pursuing liberty on multiple fronts, or do you think it should be like an aggressive game of let's consolidate and do counter economics and sap them of their uh, that that livelihood ladder <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i could i would have put good money on that one from you well that, that's the only way it can work if you do consolidate it and do it as a mass effort because you just not paying your taxes isn't gonna isn't gonna do a great deal you need to get shitloads of people your whole focus, economy focus their effort there yeah and um <clears throat> kind of dancing around all over the place but then um so you have a 
a big chunk of our community is the uh, so-called Boogaloo boys who, who are all for a, a violent revolution. And um, something uh, the Lady Anarchist brought up on episode, was it 34? Um, you, guys, you guys were talking about uh, you know, violent revolutions. We've tried quite a few of them across this planet and uh, no free societies yet despite all the, uh, all the parading around and, and usage of you know, freedom and liberty, we still have massive states, especially in those places like you know, France, the US, where uh, we've had these revolutions. And um, <clears throat> I, I guess it brings us to, uh, a lot of people are starting to get disillusioned where it's like, they, they see uh, the penultimate solution to be a violent revolution, but then they're not looking at at history where uh, it, it just hasn't worked before and they're kind of going around in circles and um violent revolutions might be just another way of uh playing the state's game because even if you win it's just going to get reborn again as we saw with the u.s coming from uh, the british empire it's, well, it's, it's not even pragmatic and historical to assert that it's simple logic if violence is the tool of the state and you use the tools of the state to dismantle it yeah what, what what exactly and like even if you look if you look in like every country like you guys had cromwell we had george washington the french had robespierre everybody has an example of like a violent revolution that just turns back into a state yeah. so it's like it's like oh, really the only examples. the only like chemotherapy to the state's cancer is counter <laughs> it's like the only thing that works i like that phrasing um i think i think there's like a um I, and I agree with Sal here a hundred percent. But I think while we're developing that counter economic, um, I, I hate to call it nation state, but you know what I mean? Like community, <laughs> counter economic community uh, that's going to rival other nation states, hopefully. Um, I think that the existing nation states could become violent. I think that the uh, arming up is a, an important part of deterrence to give us time to develop yeah. these things. Uh, and so mm. while I'm not a, boogaloo boy by any stretch i absolutely don't want that i highly recommend arming up and and you know you just stack the odds as much as you're in your favor as possible uh in the meantime yeah no i, I think that's the, the best possible way to frame it arm up with your black market arms dealer <laughs> so support your local, your local black market yeah oh. Damn it, there, there could be a counter to that argument though because if you want to use historical examples again the, with the french revolution once the uh, monarchies of Europe saw one of the most powerful countries on the continent try and go without a monarchy. They all immediately declared war on them, like absolute all-out war. And if they didn't fight back, it would have just been a total invasion. And the, the surrounding states aren't just going to watch this happen. And arming up, doesn't that create the possibility of a standing army and then all the shit from there? Well, well, I, I, I'm I not we, saying it's a bad thing to do, but what alternative could there be if, I, if there I, are I guess wars? The key is the the militia argument. Like, keep it decentralized. Um, all these right. people who are like, oh, well, how do we, you know, keep in contact and how do we, how do we organize? It's like, don't be be the rifle behind every blade of grass. Just that constant threat in in every little hick town. You don't know if there's a militia or if there's, you know, like a, like a fully trained unit of people. But then it's not like a standing army, and that's that's the beautiful thing about the US and what hopefully um, this advent of 3D printing will bring to uh, much of the rest of the world where you don't know who's going to be armed and how many of them there are. And, and that is what um, keeps other nation states from invading. And like, cause I mean, we've seen the amount of quagmires uh, nation states have gone themselves into just in the last uh, century and even the last 20 years. So that's, you know, sort of, I, and I know you're doing the devil's advocate thing, but, I, I guess that's the solution to that um, yeah, worry. It's it's the only solution, but it's the it's it's a f fucking good one. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm thinking like this: if the state the, for the state to stop you from doing counter economics, they have to first know that you are doing it, right? That's actually one of our questions. <laughs> how do we how do, how do we prevent so if, getting uh, so, shut down before we even start? Yeah, so but, 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 we have but, but, but. so many great tools to stop. Uh, the state from figuring out what's going on. Yeah. Hey, Alex, when you talk, sometimes there's like a like a staticky popping noise. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> hmm. That's very weird. I'll see if I can change my sensitivity. Perhaps. Is it? Yeah. All right. <laughs>
then uh, yeah, that sounds that sounds good now. I think you're good. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. I was fiddling with the settings. Uh, there was a little bit. So <laughs> it's not that bad. Yeah, we could deal with it. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess, I guess uh, my final note on sort of anarcho Zionism would be um. So we see uh, things like arcology and various um, you know, so-called stateless communities trying to practice some their their stuff within state uh, state-run societies. Um, do you think there's any merit to these as a sort of a so so um, the arcology experiment in uh, in Arizona, north of Phoenix? Um, damn it, I always forget its name. We did a whole episode on this, uh, but. <laughs> but they, they called themselves the urban laboratory. So they were testing out um, how to maximize efficiency within a community, um, you know, basically keeping all self-contained stuff. And and um, we did an episode with Don't Tax Me, Bro, about um, using this as like a, a standard to uh, maximize efficiency without a government and, and how this would be a good way to do stateless societies because we're, we're not wasting anything uh, the way government yeah, naturally goes about wasting resources. And uh, do you think there's any merit to testing out these various um, self-contained societies and such prior to a state being dissolved? So it's not just, uh, <laughs> I hate to use the word, chaos um, when a state does disappear. Or do you think the market will kind of um, naturally remedy where the state falls short as it gets eroded? That's a really packed question, but hopefully someone followed me all the way through. That's a good one. I'm not really that familiar with that project, but I mean, forming communities isn't a bad thing. Maybe somebody else knows more about that specific project, though. Let me just pull up the name of it so we can reference it in the episode. Arcosanti. So uh, it's, uh, it, it, it was um, concerned with uh, doing away with um, like the whole road system and how uh, cities are spread out over like you know, miles and miles and sort of stacking it and um, being uh, energy proficient and all this. and and um they were kind like kind of lefty leaning and um the main problem was funding in the end like the the ideas were sound but the funding wasn't there and so obviously have you guys you have you guys read um community technology by carl hess mm-hmm. it, it, it reminds me of um what you're like describing reminds me of what he set up in in the dc area which i'm sure a couple of people probably here have read it but um basically yeah, he sets up like this whole like underground economy for like food production, and it's like this very yeah. like community oriented sort of leftist kind of flavored sort of operation. Very similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, it's it's sort of uh, doing away with um, everything, kind of, and it does plug into the agorist school of thought, like because uh, it's um, you, you're not you know shipping things in, and you're not transporting things across the state's rail and stuff. You're you're keeping it also. The community grows its food and people work there and everything's kept in like a, a local economy and um, you're not wasting anything. And I, I think it can kind of work as a, a template for uh, insulating society from um, you know, the so-called collapse. But, but then it, that's more in the school of thought of uh, like the government's going to collapse tomorrow and then you have to, you know, rebuild rather than um, the more... Uh, Agora school thought where it, it's just gradually getting eroded as uh, as the people step up and provide services the government's failing on and and, and doesn't have the uh, the tax money to fund and they just gradually peel everything back until it's eroded. I mean, Per Byland has a good article on LouRockwell.com that's like 15 years old now where he talks about vertical and horizontal counter economics and like horizontal counter economics. It kind of sounds like maybe that's what you're describing because like. He talks about like setting up local production facilities that like sort of bypass state regulations and stuff like that. So maybe yeah, like yeah, a, that, that's exactly what we're getting into. Horizontal is like establishing local production facilities that bypass state regulations, and then vertical counter economics. And sometimes I confuse them, so don't crucify me <laughs> if I do. But the vertical brand is like more black market um, entrepreneurial Konkin style counter economics. Mm, gotcha. So yes, does that, it sounds to me it's sort of like a community versus market act. Is that a way you, to distill you, it? You, you really need both of them if you think about it. And oh, really, yeah. oh, yeah. if you think about it, all of our all of our successes, the, the biggest agorist successes from Ross Ulbricht and the Silk Road to Cody Wilson and 3D Printer 
and Satoshi and the white paper, it all combines both of them. So like, for example, like Bitcoin, like you have the local production facility, which would be like your miner because you're producing the Bitcoin yourself. Yeah, yeah. And then the vertical uh, aspect is, you know, where you trade with your peers and you're distributing the Bitcoin or like your 3D printer is a great example of a local production facility that's as local of a production facility as you can get. And then you print guns and you sell them to people who can't get guns because they live in statist areas. So all of our biggest successes have always been like a combination of the two. And I didn't even think about it until like I read this article by Per Island and he like, it just speaks to how much of like how brilliant this guy actually is. Yeah, I love him. Yeah, he's my favorite. So, <laughs> I think he's the only agorist with a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Take, make of that what you will. Right. <laughs> we need that. There you go. Give some legitimacy to, uh, you right. know, there, there, there's, uh, there's some paper that says he knows what he's talking about. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so we've, we've uh, sort of shat on all the alternatives to um, agorism, but um, I guess we should start getting into uh, the very basics and sort of uh, build on that of, of what it is. So can anyone give uh, an explanation like you're explaining to a five-year-old or to uh, me? <laughs> I'm... Sounds like a job for Sal. I mean, it's just, it's counter-economics. It's synonymous. So it's, you, can, you can use the terms interchangeably. And I guess I would describe counter-economics as vertical and horizontal counter-economics. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, like, um, I guess my question would be, what is the, what is the end goal? And we've kind of covered it, but just to, like, put it in black and white, what is the end goal of um, agorist? Agora, free, free market, market economy. I, I mean, you're, you're, you're trying to increase the percentage of uh, voluntary interactions in your life versus non-voluntary interactions in your life um, to the, uh, uh, for, for, and hopefully along with your fellow man who's doing the same thing uh, so that you can both increase the total percentage of voluntary interactions in your life versus the other. How would you contrast uh, sort of anarcho-capitalism with agorism? Anyone? Like, are they, are they the same? Are they interchangeable? Or what's, what's the key differences to someone who, who doesn't know? I think Sal uh, probably thinks or, or 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 looks at it, but like there's a a big a bigger difference if I understand him correctly. I I always kind of looked at it like anarcho capitalism was the um, kind of like the the philosophy and agorism was the, was the strategy. But um, I think Sal probably has a little bit more to say about it than I do. Yeah, because that, that's where I would. That's where I am. I don't know if that's it or if there's more to it. I, I generally agree with 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 that. I just think you know. Some of the ANCAPs get themselves in trouble when they start, you know, voting and promoting the LP and stuff like that. So, but generally, yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I, one big distinction that I really love is the Agorist class theory, which is something that anarcho capitalism doesn't have, but it's a very useful uh, way to categorize, well, to add to the extra categories, like how Agorism expands on the kinds of markets and introduces the idea of red markets. Yeah. Uh, it also then introduces the idea of the class theory of the entrepreneur and the status capitalist. And I, th I think that's just a very valuable piece of theory to add to the whole, this whole corner of thought. So um, what are the, uh, the markets that um, the agorism uh, comes up with? We've got black market. Gray. Uh, gray, red. White, red. Um, is that all of them? I feel like them, I might be missing one. All cars pink. of the rainbow. You're missing the pink. <laughs> <laughs> pink ah, there you go oh well the pink is actually one i say ah and then i start reading them and i get less excited <laughs> like <laughs> market war taxation state torture imprisonment and compulsory education oh oh fuck that's like the worst one yeah no. <laughs> i i actually hadn't heard of the pink market so um we're all learning um i should, should we just go through them for the for the viewers sake sure that's good Alex, do you want to take it away? <laughs> so it's there's three uh, categories how to at the top, and then there's if it's moral or immoral. Uh, so the, in the first category we have state approval, and that's what uh, we call the white market and the pink market. Um, so in the white market you have legal employment, legal business, tax goods, regulated goods, and in the pink market, 
you have war, taxation, state torture, imprisonment, and compulsory education. These are very close to each other. One is immoral, one is moral. And then we have the middle one, which is banned unless done in state-defined manner. And that's where we have the gray market and the red market. In the gray market, we have employment off the books, on tax goods, on reg regulated... Re blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Harbor unregulated unre goods. And in the red market, we have murder, theft, rape, and slavery. And at the very end, we have state banned stuff, which means some drugs, some sex, some weapons. And if the state is not involved, it's also murder, theft, rape, and slavery from the red market says uh, banned as well. It's, when you're se separating uh, stuff like this, you get a, a more nu nuanced uh, picture of what's going on and why there, why there are five markets and why it's important to separate them from each other. Because I would murder someone, it would be immoral even if the state approved of it or if, or if they didn't, right? Mm -hmm. Or if I started a war with a car, <laughs> it would still be immoral even if the state is not involved in it. But if the state is okaying it, then I can start a war with Carr, and I can murder Sal, and then I can <laughs> enslave uh, bloody revolutions. You must be a Marine. I go down to Oslo Centrum, and I sell some heroin. I will go to prison. But if I'm a doctor, I have a white coat on me, and I work at a hospital, <laughs> then it's okay to give people heroin. Mm. So this is the as long as it's got difference, the, stick the main differences. <laughs> yeah. And the, the gray market is the most exciting one because it's in between, right? I'm not, I'm, if I'm going tobacco, right? So that's legal to do. But if mm -hmm. I would sell it, I need to be, have a license. So if I don't, uh, if I sell it without a license, then I think I'll go to jail. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> it's, a very, it's very bad for me to do that, at least in the, in the eyes of the state. But if I got a license, and sold it and taxed it, then it would be in the white market. If I was growing cocaine, then it would be in the black market. And there's this, the distinction here as well is that uh, everything in the moral category is a voluntary interaction, regardless of whether the state wants it done or not. The reason it's classed as moral is because no force is being used. And that's why the whole end goal of this is a society without violence. Well, it's, uh, it, it's just... I, I just get pissed looking at the five markets, you know, because <laughs> th things that um, just just a stamp can make something uh, fine to do. And I mean, of, of course, we're all far down this rabbit hole. But um, for those newer to libertarianism we, we, and, and agorism, anarchy and all this, just just looking at how close these things are, like there's just the only thing separating them is a stamp, is a license, is someone voting on uh on if you can or cannot do this like things that were in the the black market just years ago you know there's a vote and suddenly it's it's legalized and suddenly they can the state can capitalize off it uh you know in a, in a public manner like like weed uh all of a sudden something that people are losing decades of their life for is is a-okay to, okay. to okay. do out on the street and it's like if that doesn't wake you up christ knows what will and it's it's not uh, only harmful stuff that the state uh, really state uh, forbids and, and hates. They hate uh, if you compete with one of their cartels as well. Uh, hmm. One of my favorite anecdotes is there was two Norwegian kids. They are like 12 and 13, or, or they were rather. So one of them got a boat for a birthday gift from his dad. And he, him and his best friend needed uh, gas money for the boat because they wanted to go out fishing and having fun on their summer vacation. So what they figured out was that, hey, if we fish some crabs and we cook the crabs and we sell it to relatives, people we know, we can make some money and we can turn that money into gas money and uh, maybe have, have some cool stuff as well. And the sales went so well, so they started a, a website to sell, sell even more because money, right? <laughs> <laughs> Little entrepreneurs. And they had a, a cell phone number on the website, which you could text or call, and you could put in an order. I'm not 100% sure that's a very convenient way to handle your business, but hey, 
first guy that called was from the uh, Norwegian Fish Fishing Ministry, mm. telling them that they, what they were doing was actually legal and they would um, call the cops if they didn't stop. So you can imagine how that uh, affected like two 12, 12 year olds. So they, one of them went to his dad and was crying and like, the police is going to take me because I'm a criminal. <laughs> so the dad had to call the authorities and um, what they, they could sell uh, as much crab as they wanted, but they had to go through a cartel that sets mm. the price for the crabs and uh, the kilogram price like tenfolded because they had to sell through this. So they got less <laughs> business and they have to share a cut with this cartel and it's just oh, such a mess. They've been protected and served. <laughs> Sounds like a, <laughs> like, like a Norwegian lemonade stand. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, uh, they're a lot more talented than someone uh, taking some powdered shit and pouring some water in it. Um, <laughs> no, right on. Um, that, Imagine uh, being a fishing pig and actually looking for people's <laughs> fishing license. That's the only thing you can do with your life. <laughs> the, the, the way you put bread on the table is bullying 13-year-olds. Like, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> on a boat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You're a hero. Thank you. you imagine, can you imagine yeah. getting in a dinghy every morning, firing up that little like like two stroke <laughs> engine on the back, and being like, "Well, time to go bust some thirteen year olds." <laughs> like, that's your life. I'm doing oh, my, my part. part. <laughs> doing my part. <laughs> we pay for a civilized society. <laughs> <laughs> what would we do about fishing pigs? <laughs> fishing pigs. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my new favorite term. Almost every market has these special interest groups that controls that specific uh, part of what people can trade on a white market or a gray market. Well, everyone uh, here in Norway, we have milk quotas. So, mm. so there, there's milk a quotas. Yes, so there's a com uh, I think it's a state-run uh, business. It's quotas every year. Okay, so this much uh, milk we can produce per year. How many liters would you like to buy, dear farmer, <laughs> with a cow? <laughs> and so you, you're buying these quotas from, from a, uh, in an auction-style system. Over your quota, you have to pay uh, punishment fees and extra taxes. <laughs> Produce too much milk. Just <laughs> don't, don't be too productive. You're stepping on the other yeah, guys. Exactly, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like uh. an internal market. Just the state don't want someone to overproduce because then someone else is, uh, can sell milk or something. I don't, it's very complicated. So what this mechanic has done is that the, the milk prices are like insane. They're like double from Sweden. <laughs> that is across the border. So um, uh, Ger German farmers and Polish farmers was trying to export uh, milk to Norway because they saw the profit margins and it was like, I mean, <laughs> so the, <laughs> And then the state had to uh, increase the tariffs on milk by 400% or something. A ridiculous number. Just so that imported milk couldn't compete on, uh, with Norwegian farmers on uh, milk prices. So now, now you're like stacking problems on top of each other. <laughs> like you need to protect these poor farmers from, from the evil uh, uh, exporters. And just, it's just insane. One intervention you get the next. God, everything about that is just textbook. The like the first lesson you'll ever do in economics of what should not be done. That is crazy. As you being a vegan and having to pay for that, I have to imagine. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, when you have policies that make Brits shiver, like that, that's pretty fucking bad. <laughs> good, good old protectionism, if you can even fucking call it that. Uh, but it gets worse. Uh, there is a special oh. tax, a spe special tax on uh, produced goods. So uh, Norway is a monarch monarchy, democratic, uh, social democratic. They still have monarchy at the bottom. You haven't killed yours yet? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no it's still, it's still, it's We're in the same kidding. boat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when the when the monarch was the ruler, he taxed all the farms a specific amount. So if you milk or meat or whatever you produce in a farm, uh, a certain fee per kilo or liter or whatever volume makes sense to tax on. When the, um, when the 
Norwegian society turn into more, uh, demo democracy. They they saw this tax and they're like, huh, let's keep it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. We, we can uh, we can afford all the roads. Exactly. <laughs> now the, those those fees are going to a department of uh, a marketing department that informs Norwegian consumers about why drinking milk milk is healthy and <laughs> yeah, how much meat you should eat per per day. <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that it's like insane statistics and stuff very productive much needed. <laughs> thank you government <laughs> the government are the last fucking people you should be taking diet advice from i love that picture of the is it the german minister of health belgian oh, yeah god belgian, belgian, belgian that's the one. it's like <laughs> it's like something out of charlie, charlie and the chocolate factory Oh, she's the last minister of health. <laughs> I, I'm I'm honestly surprised she's still alive. <laughs> Wouldn't it just be something if, if a minister of health killed over from a heart attack? It's only a matter of time. Oh yeah, seriously. It's like, please, while she's in office, like <laughs> nothing against the nothing against the individual, more just the position. Mm. Maybe something against the individual. Um, Look, we fired our last transition guy and our current one. Got some questions got fired? about him. And she's no. she, she just... <laughs> I was talking about VR was fired. Oh. Yeah, then you she stepped out. That was my transition. There you go. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Turn that around. <laughs> Bam. Do so you guys want to start the Google it? I'm just kidding. Go ahead, Gar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you first. Um, <laughs> a good topic to get into would be... Uh, what are the best ways to practice um, agorism in your daily life? I'm a serial walker, walker. Best ways? I don't know. Sal, what do you got? Best ways to, to, <laughs> I to do it? Answers. By I'm, always, I'm just deflecting to Sal. Yeah, I was waiting for someone to say that. <laughs> by Bitcoin, screw the Fed and the Fed by Bitcoin. Yep. By, um, by cryptocurrency and 3D print guns and yeah. stats, print gats. <laughs> Work under the table. And uh, if, well, a lot of people want to know how to uh, get Bitcoin without going through uh, an exchange. There's something, there's a website called Local Bitcoins. Look that up if you're in this situation where you can exchange like cold hard cash in person for Bitcoin instead of, you know, giving your driver's license and a bunch of personal info to a company which is regulated by the government and then passes the information on. There, There is an alternative. I've, I've had a few people message me that for various reasons um are in a lot of trouble with government and can't legally get bitcoin through that system so there's an alternative i could never remember the name local bitcoins if you're in that situation you've got no excuse buy that shit yeah or skip that you can skip that entirely get a friend who it like can just buy bitcoin give them the money and then they can get you it and send it to a like a a cold storage wallet and there you go easy done you just need to if you don't ask you don't get there's a whole bunch of peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Like, there's local coin swap, local bitcoins, local dot bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> really, the best way, though, I think, is to earn it. If you can like find a way to earn or to get paid in cryptocurrency, that's like the best way to go about it. Or you can also mine it. Mining Bitcoin is a great way to acquire it in like a non KYC off the books kind of way. Yeah, that's true. Uh, opening a wallet costs nothing. Yeah. And like you don't need any ID, it just gives you a random ass number that you and um, there you go. You've got a wallet you can receive Bitcoin, sell shit. Put it down. I mean, as soon just get do something in that space, uh, like like open a big like create a Bitcoin wallet or uh, you know send a Bitcoin transaction or receive some. It's like it's just so refreshing to do it without permission. Like it, it's mm -hmm. you know if you have a lot of experience, maybe if there's if there's younger kids listening to this that are not um, that you know aren't necessarily working a full time job and have to deal with like moving money around and like the banking system. Man, sending, receiving, storing, uh, just everything with Bitcoin, especially now compared to like five years ago, is just so refreshing. You don't have to ask anybody's permission. You do whatever the hell you want. And, uh, and it just works. Like it's, it's, it doesn't, you know, you don't get s snagged on KYC AML. You don't get snagged going across borders. It just works. It's a, it's really incredible. They can never touch it. They can never confiscate your money. You don't have to worry about the state. Like no matter Civil what happens, they, they can never, you're right. Yeah. 
exactly. There's, like, the, there's the, nothing like having a little stash in cold storage and knowing that no bank can get to it. It's a really good yeah. feeling. <laughs> yeah, I think there was, did you guys see there was like some guy, I forget the, the exact story, but I posted on Twitter, he like got caught maybe in England brought, bringing oh, yeah. in something like that. And it's like, well, you can't, you can't confiscate a, a, you know, a number that's in my head, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like, they said they confiscated it, but they don't, but they don't have the, pri- or it, it, the, the headline was ridiculous. Like to anybody that understands Bitcoin or anything like that, it's like, <laughs> it's like they confiscated the public key, but they don't have the private key or something. Like that. <laughs> like, yeah, they the guy said that he had the pri- the key written down on pieces of paper stuffed in a golf club and the golf club was that like it was thrown away by accident and that's why they couldn't have his bitcoin because he the golf club fishing accident. Yeah, yeah basically <laughs> it was a substantial think, amount too i think his uh, land- landlord was supposed to trash have trashed it wink wink <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> well, like uh, like guns in a boating accident kind of thing, or I've made mm-hmm. that joke. Come on, did you? Charlie Shrem, I think has. I think he said he wrote, or I forget. I think it was Charlie. Somebody, I I think I think I'm pretty sure it was Charlie. But don't quote me. Somebody actually wrote a little private key on the inside of their wedding ring, and then like <laughs> gave it to their wife so that like. I guess, you know, he felt confident she was going to take it off or divorce him or anything, you know. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's that's a brave dude. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, Christ. You get robbed. Yeah, yeah, give me the ring. Uh, I'd really <laughs> rather not. I can't get it off. So here's another one. Kind of in the same vein. Um, a lot of people kind of stuck in cities. I'm, everyone has this idealistic vision of uh, having a little, the little ranch, doing everything themselves, you know, growing their own stuff. Um their own animals, livestock, uh, you know, renewable energy, all that good stuff. Um, but how does one go about um, living an agoristic lifestyle uh, in a in a city? Like, just be homeless. Be homeless. All that right. Th- <laughs> thank you, Angler. <laughs> You're not paying the tax. <laughs> you you are not aiding the state in the slightest. Right. <laughs> there we go. One hundred and one, <clears throat> right here. I've got um, I've got a big aquaponics set up in my apartment so that I can oh, nice. grow fish and like um, you know, vegetables or whatever, herbs or whatever, and uh, you know, that's one way to do it. I think I know Alex does it a little bit differently. He he thinks he's probably a little bit more productive than I am. Maybe he should tell you about you know all that, but you can definitely do it. I wouldn't be discouraged because you live in a small place. Yeah. Uh, does can, Alex have something on your website about it? Um, I think I, I, I know he wrote something for the New Libertarian about um, like growing in small spaces. Oh yeah, that's what it was. Yes, it's my uh, it's my own long long term project. I'm after this uh, summer. I'm going to compile it into a book that's going to be called "Come and Taste It." Oh nice! And it's basically <laughs> going to be that's like awesome. 30, thirty pages on how you can grow as much tomatoes as possible and as in a small place. I grew 10 pounds of tomatoes on a small kitchen counter last year. I'm going to top it off, do even more this year. That's the plan, at least. But in a, in a city, in an urban environment, you have a lot of fun stuff that you can do that's not permitted, per se. <laughs> you can start a poker club, for example, invite some people you trust, and then you can ship, ship, um, pile a bunch of money in on a table, and then you can with some brewers, then you can sell quality beer for very cheap to the, to these poker poker guys, or whatever you feel like doing. Well, if you know how to repair stuff, you can do it under the table. If you know how to build stuff, you can do it under the table. So the important thing is like not only like self sufficiency, but also like commercialize it. You know, mm-hmm. all growing tomatoes, then <laughs> there's very little trading going on. <laughs> we, we we lack the division of labor part that's where that's a very important piece aren't you making wine though or something like that i forget i am hopefully this year i will hopefully make tomato wine but last year we made i didn't make enough we just ate all the tomatoes (laughs) you ate all the tomatoes did you eat those raw or did you eat those cooked uh a mix we made we we, we tried making some ketchup (laughs) some salsa I want to buy tomato wine from you and pay you in Monero. 
looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working as a beer brewer now. That's my legal employment, so to speak. <laughs> I'm le learning how to make beer as well. So it's Good going to, hustle. yeah, exactly. I'm hopefully going to make some stuff that I like limited edition stuff that I will only sell to people I love. <laughs> <laughs> I have some Bitcoin, of course. Uh, making beer is like one of those things that you can make so much beer. Like you can make a lot of beer uh, pretty reasonably and everybody loves beer. Like you can trade that for anything. In the community. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I was about to say, like, well, making any sort of alcohol, I mean, that's going to be a, a good, a valuable trading item just for, like, damn near any service. Like, someone comes over and, like, I don't know, they help you move. Would you give, would you give them a six-pack of beer or, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, guys, I got to bounce, uh, but it's been so awesome talking to a bunch of agorists. Uh, so uh, I hope you guys continue and, and get into some more cool shit, and I can't wait to listen on the other end. Much love. <laughs> Bye. Cool, man. Indeed. Thanks Car for joining us. Folks. Okay, buddy. Cheerio. Uh, he didn't hear you. Fucking oh. stereotype. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love it when I give him a cheerio. Ah. I think it's probably just as easy to practice agorism or counter economics in a city than as it would be in the country because you're going to have more people around for trading and farmers markets and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I was, I was it's even to... easier. Yeah. To yeah. <laughs> Like tradesman stuff, like uh, I, I know the uh, Jared from Buying the Bullet, he, he does, you know, plumbing and stuff. I mean, you not saying I would or do, but like there's, there's all sorts of ways you if you have tradesman buddies, you know, pay them under the table uh, with uh, various you know, homegrown stuff, uh, homemade wine, beer, uh, whatever you might have. I mean, that that's a good way to, um, you know, keep it untaxed. I was, free trade I was looking at uh, how I, how I could uh, recoup the cost of a 3D printer and I'm forbidden from making guns with it because my girlfriend is a statist. <laughs> <laughs> Work on it. And relate. <laughs> um, I was looking on uh, on one of uh, the deterrence dispensed uh, guy's video where he was talking about uh, Glock mags. And I was casually looking up the price price range for Glock mags if you buy it in a store here in Norway. And it costs like 55 bucks to, for one Jesus. Glock mag. It was fucking expensive over here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think I calculated it to like four bucks in production cost. So if you make, make the mag a little snazzy with some Norwegian flag or something, I don't know what people like. <laughs> <laughs> It would, wouldn't take a lot of mags to recoup the cost of a uh, three. Hello. Oh, so one of those. Um, so like that production angle with a printer, if or if you have a you're a handy guy with tools, then it's there's a, there's endless amounts of stuff you can make. Yeah, I mean, and, and with uh, the way technology is going, that's only going to increase in, in what you can do in your own home. Mm -hmm. it also depends on what exactly like counter economic activity you're looking to like engage in, like. So yeah, maybe growing or like a large amount of crops or something would be easier if you like weren't in an urban environment, but it's easier to run guns or something like that in a more densely packed like place. Like I, I I'm, I'm right outside the New York city area and I'll like in Newark, New Jersey, everybody is an agorist, but nobody knows what agorism is. It's like, everybody's yeah. like selling drugs or selling guns or like they're not. <laughs> they're avoiding taxes or like they're doing something like illegal. They just, they're just doing it for their own self-interest without knowing mm -hmm. the, the political ideology behind it. That's probably going to be mostly the case too. Just natural responses to everything that's going on. People will turn to agorism without knowing the philosophy. Which is great, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. like technology get, grows, it'll only become more common. Yeah, for sure. Like you can get, um, like the guns on, in, like you can get, like the stuff you get off the street is cheaper than the stuff you get in the store. Mm -hmm. you know? Oh, significantly. Yeah, I, I think the the trend at the minute is people are noticing more and more that government's getting in the way. Like ordinary people, are like, wait, why is government in my way? I'm I'm just trying to live my life. Like they they stop seeing it as as some uh, benevolent force and and more like a roadblock and. The more that happens, I mean, the better for us and, and our cause, of course. But um, 
I see that like in everyday the, life too, you know, like yeah. in like the everyday like functions that you go through. Like that's the stuff that really pisses people off. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I forgot, I forgot to renew my tags and now I'm out. Like, I, right. I'm, in, I'm in trouble and I'm paying this money that I don't have and now I'm pissed off and exactly. sure enough, it, it snowballs. <laughs> <laughs> But my favorite libertarian conversion stories are when people are like, yeah, so I got stopped by a cop, and then... <laughs> it's a very easy way to turn somebody into a, an anarchist. <laughs> yeah, like... I'm going to pay a ticket for something stupid. Yeah, like, why is this a law? And then I tried to uh, then I tried to vote on it, and then I got fucked up, and then, yeah, now I'm here. <laughs> Jack on the side of the road by the loser from high school, and we'll see how quickly <laughs> You're voting libertarian. <laughs> yeah. You're from waving the flag to saying ACAB. Uh, <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> um, my transitions are really fucking clunky, but it's because I'm so awkward on the subject because I'm still learning. I, I'm like asking these questions as if I'm like phrasing it for the audience, but I'm also phrasing it for myself. Um, so uh, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about um, like cutting off uh, tax revenue for the state. Um, we, we've gone into... Uh, under the table, like side businesses and stuff. Is there any more direct ways with your um your like salary, your income? Uh, do you have any advice on how to give as little as possible? I think if you if you run a business, you should pay your employees in cryptocurrency because it's easier for them to evade taxation. But I think more to the point, like on taxes, and like this comes from like Erwin Schiff, who said that he had this whole idea where if we can get tax compliance below 75%, the state won't be able to pay their bills. And like, they're going to have like this like internal crisis and that would be great for us. But of course, you know, they didn't, the LP wouldn't, you know, they didn't want to hear any of that. So they just kind of like put it to the side. But I think like that's the key. If you can get people to stop paying their taxes, that's, that's a huge step in the right direction. I haven't paid federal taxes in like, I don't know, four or five years five years I think this is my fifth year that i haven't paid now so and like i'm not <clears throat> i probably i probably should do it just to see if they owe me money but i don't even want to go down that road <laughs> but i just i think if you know i i start i stopped paying taxes because i heard i don't know if you guys know ian freeman from uh from mm-hmm. free talk live he he's a real old school libertarian and he uh when I decided to stop paying taxes, he's, he was like, yeah, he's like, I haven't paid taxes in 10 years. And I was like, why the fuck am I getting robbed? And this guy hasn't paid in 10 years. Like, I'm not going to pay more either. So I stopped paying. Real American like, hero. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't tell you don't pay your taxes because then they'll do to me what they did to Erwin Schiff. But the only reason I won't say that is because I don't want to wind up in jail. Yeah. <laughs> That look into making a house like a homestead or something like that, and then um, consuming less repair, barter, trade, yeah, repair, reduce, Fix. reuse, <laughs> cycle, <Die wide. laughs> yeah, or inst- instead of buying your own set of tools, borrow made from a friend or mm-hmm. use like sharing yeah. services, even what was that, even like, um decentralized like sharing services like i know you can like rent a car on uh like airbnb or something i wouldn't be surprised if you can like rent other things whatever you're looking for you know mm-hmm. this is where this is where someone's gonna be like rent share commies which <laughs> you would be paying for but, but, it obviously it wouldn't be free yeah, yeah. I mean, some accountability there paying. you sure. certainly don't have a right to it right, right. in tools is just economics right why, why do I need, uh, between me and my friends, why do we need four hammers no, using it all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, um, I, that's why I quite like the idea of uh, like getting more in touch with your local community. Because, like, I mean, like, like you just said, you know, four friends have four hammers. I mean, I mean same thing happens when, uh, if, if you don't talk to any of your neighbors and you all have the same stuff and you're all paying for the same stuff and, you know, it breaks, you go to the store, pay taxes on these things. Every time you need to replace it, it's like, well... Right. I mean, it's it's going to be a hard message to get to people who are. Uh, we live in a very materialistic age, and it, and it mm-hmm. sounds it sounds kind of lefty, but end of the day, get it in your head that these kind of things hurt the state in the long run, and the the more this kind of thing happens, the more damage you're doing. 
Every cent that you deprive the state of is a cent that they can't use to murder a child. That's the way I look at mm -hmm. it. Absolutely. Can, you, you can pay rent if you are um, borrowing a hammer or a snow shovel or whatever. Like, it make, a, make your neighbor a meal. <laughs> <laughs> some mm -hmm. of the potatoes you can grow or something, you know, like barter. Exactly. Yep. Pro produce and share. That's and, and basic produce, stuff. produce as little for the state as possible at the same time. <laughs> yep. Close, close the door. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. Um, here's a question I quite like. Uh, so if you, so you've got all the means necessary to live uh, like the ideal agorist lifestyle, like the homestead kind of thing today, what would you do? I mean, exactly. Like if I was going to go homestead today, what, what, how would we do it? Y yeah, yeah. Like you got as much land as you need. You've got, you know, all the resources you need. How would you go about setting yourself up for success to uh, be as effective? I try to be off grid. Like, <clears throat> um, I hate to use this guy as an example, but I don't know if you guys follow Tom Massey on Twitter. He's a congressman from Kentucky, but he lives. Oh, the, the guy who does like the dorky botanist kind of stuff. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, like, it's beautiful, but it is. He, yeah, he's he's it. Some weird I, I, I love it. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he does everything off grid. He like he's got like a root cellar, and I mean, you could, there's all different things you could do. You could like um, build a water tower, and you know, there's different ways to get power, especially if you, like if you have a river near you, or if you live in a windy area or something like that. You just have to do your research. But like, any way you can get off grid is great. That's that, that's really key because then you could like you're you know you'll never be completely off the off the radar, but it'll help certainly. Yeah, right. Well. <laughs> you can have an oil well. <laughs> that would be pretty rad. That'd be really rad. Then you wouldn't need to homestead, though. <laughs> <laughs> you can live on an oil platform like uh, the Sealand guys. I don't <laughs> works, but it, <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's hard because we are, we are so different. We have different needs, right? It's mm -hmm. hard to imagine a perfect paradise. Plus, you you can do everything yourself. Right? And it would be hard work. Have you seen this uh, Rob Greenfield guy who tried to only eat food or forage for a year? And like 70 to 80 hours per week just gathering food and straw storing food. So, so. Oh, wow. well, well, I guess I guess that's where uh, free trade comes into it. You know, know your neighbors and, and division of labor. Like, you know, you might produce these things. Like, you, you do uh, more... Uh, you know, vegetables and stuff, they have livestock, you know, get together with your community and, and trade for goods and services rather than doing all your, on your own, you know? That's the idea, at least. <laughs> yeah. In New Hampshire, they sell, they, they do that, but they trade it with, like, for, like, silver dollars and, like, dash and stuff like that. Mel, do you have any, any major questions you want to get into? I do. I ha just had one, but, oh, yeah, like, what are some major examples of agorism working? Doing the same thing I am now. <laughs> we're talking a geographical area or is that press oh, i this this was from a twitter right yeah i mean anything like so i guess you know skype you uber uh the soviet union anything <laughs> <laughs> uh black markets has always worked but this is so different right um my setup works <laughs> Or it used to work. I, I was uh, when I was working as a bartender and got got seventy percent of my uh, income under the table, which worked great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, is, uh, uh, is that what got you in trouble? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. The, the Norwegian ca uh, version of Cash App is owned by a Norwegian state bank. Ooh. A lot of transactions going back and forth. That didn't work out so well for me. <laughs> 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 How many times did you say you've gotten in trouble? Like three? Uh, three times. Not not the same kind of trouble, but yeah. It, has it has it been ramping up or or? Oh, <laughs> it's about it stayed about the same. I've never got caught and uh, fined or prison in, in prison for for anything. We're gonna start a uh, agorist bail fund for Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, I'm I'm still paying for that uh, tax lawyer. Christ. <laughs> I guess that's the real fine. <laughs> Are you able to talk about what happened? Allegedly? Um, allegedly not. <laughs> what are you accused of? Tax evasion. 
that were tax fraud. Uh, all I think times? Prob- no, no, no. Uh, the other times we can take a in a, on a different occasion. But uh, <laughs> gotcha. so when uh, all um, when you when you settle the till at the end of your shift as a bartender here in Norway, what you used to do is count count the money. Everything that was excess in cash was yours, basically. It worked a little bit different from place to place, of course, but the places smart people work at use uh, work like that because uh, when you get tips on card, you can convert it to the cash with your employer through the till because then then they take the credit card money and you get cash instead. Good deal. I've worked for twelve years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm really good at selling drinks and food to people. So that, about 60% of my... Um, I made 10, 10K per year in uh, on, in salary at about 20K in uh, tip money. Just to give you a figure, figure where... <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a lot, of, uh, a lot of unregistered cash. <laughs> unregistered? <laughs> ah... I, I and I filtered the cash through like buying electronic stuff like laptops, cell phones, good stuff to have, and uh, metals and some local bitcoins and uh, paying my rent with the uh, with cash. I just gave my one of my roomies some cash and like, hey, I my credit card isn't working. Can you fix this for me? <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> um, and then I've. I uh, had a lot of side hustles as well, like um, uh, buying comic Marvel comic books. I was checking the schedule, uh, which new movie was coming out, which new characters was going to be introduced, and I buy all the first uh, f- the first issue these characters was in. I just emptied eBay of them, mm-hmm. and I sold to the European market, mostly Norwegian and Swedish, but all over the place. <laughs> because uh, American, American comic books isn't that common. Is this from the seventies and the eighties? Or not that not common at all here in uh, no uh, in Europe, because um, they, what they usually did is license it to a local uh, translation service, and then you have like a French Superman, and you have a French Spider Man, and you have a Swedish Batman, and like it's it's weird. So, so um, America sits where, sits on most of these comic publications, so it's was worth a lot of money here in uh, flip them at a hundred percent profit and that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I more unregistered I really, profit yeah god damn it i then i um <laughs> started a lot of hot uh, board games and then when uh, the rating started dropping in and people that didn't uh, Kickstart, kickstart a week, uh, game uh, started to regret. Uh, there comes Alex, like with a fresh board game <laughs> unopened. Hey, would you like to <laughs> buy this at a marked up price? Of course. <laughs> so a lot of those kind of stuff. I was I was doing a lot, a lot of those kind of stuff, and I used the Norwegian cash. Those ten seconds, and I was going to test Coinbase, and I used my own Visa card, so that my own. Yeah, because I was only going to test it out and use like 50 bucks or something just to see see what the Coinbase was all about and bought some Bitcoin there and stuff. Last year in January, the Norwegian government changed the taxation rules that everybody had to report tips. And how they did that was that they squeezed the employers that so they had to uh, full, show full records of how how much tips was flowing to flowing through the place. Otherwise, they would get nailed for tax fraud. So there I was. I earned 10k <laughs> white, and all of a sudden I got <laughs> up to 45k red flag. Uh, there's a lot of transactions through my to my bank account from a Norwegian version of what uh, of Cash App. Oof. I had a uh, my bank snitched on me that I ah. had uh, bought crypto. <laughs> all these three things was enough for them to file a investigation into, into my case, right? Your activities. Yeah. A damn comic, comic book kid. <laughs> I mean, clearly you were like very harmful and, and destructive to society. <laughs> so 
good, it's a good thing they put it into your rampage. Real menace. I'm so glad that we are safe from you. Mocking up those board games and stuff. I mean, you know, had to take you out. Should be at least a law against that. <laughs> that, that there ought to be a law. Um, <laughs> Oh Christ! So that's that's the gist of it. Uh, yeah. They they pile on all the yeah they had on me and then, but I how I get the... how I got out of it was just they couldn't prove that I uh, <laughs> they couldn't prove how much uh, tip money I had so they had to drop <laughs> that because they had to give give a very specific number right they couldn't just think that I made the same amount of money each year for the last <laughs> twelve years and um, as as soon as the uh, uh, investigation started. I stopped selling through through the cash app. Only accepted the uh, cryptocurrencies if they wanted to, uh, people wanted to buy comic books or board games. Uh, the Coinbase, uh, the, the crypto purchase through my credit card was just bullshit because it's just five uh, five hundred Norwegian kroners, which is about fifty bucks. So they ended up with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, the beautiful part of that is, I'm sure they expended money on your case. Yeah, <laughs> for, for no return. <laughs> that it would otherwise have been used to oppress people. Yep. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, they were being used to oppress Alex here, but ultimately, <laughs> so that's that's. Uh... To ride a cop car, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, they actually came and like full on arrested you? Uh, no, 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 no. They, oh, okay. It wasn't the rest. They 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 were nice and drove me to to the tax office. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, that's, that's gonna be one of the more colorful taxi rides out there. See that pump service for your tax money. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Finally, a fucking return. You get a free ride <laughs> to jail. <laughs> uh, which is funnily enough, uh, what Stasis would say Alex here is getting by avoiding taxes. <laughs> Yeah. I think that kind of makes That's... a good case for jury nullification. You know, like yeah. people work really hard on a case and then you just like nullify it and it's just all this money <laughs> wasted yeah. not being used to oppress people. No, it's yeah. like, fucking pouring it down the drain. Like, yep, I, that was fun, wasn't it? You want to do that again? I'll keep on volunteering. <laughs> I, I, I am I am all for jury duty. <laughs> I think we have jury nullification here in Norway. And how I know that is because um, one of the biggest uh, drug smugglers in this country was was a cop. <laughs> and his tra- oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm shocked. Here. I'm just blown away that that could happen. And uh, he got fired, of course, and then uh, he's brought in, got brought into court, and they had all this uh, evidence against him, operations. So it was he was guiding. Uh, boats into the harbor <laughs> like okay you can go now guys it's uh, the coast is clear <laughs> America that would be like two so weeks they had this vacation. Text- <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so they had all these text messages and emails and I, they found so much cash at his uh, cabin and, and drugs and the guns and <laughs> that is what he wasn't supposed to have so they had a solid case and then the jury just said no it's he's not guilty we, we're not convinced by the evidence so what uh, the judges did, they, they disregarded the jury. It's like, no, we're doing the jury. We're doing this only with judges now. <laughs> Which, <laughs> oh, weird. We asked for your opinion, and we don't like your opinion. So <laughs> we're gonna try. We're gonna try our justice. I don't want to convict him of having a gun or running drugs, but can I convict him of being a cop, Your Honor? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> In our circles, he would he would be found guilty and hung, drawn, and quartered. Um, <laughs> uh, only, only metaphorically speaking. Well, in um, agorist circles, he would be put in a labor camp. <laughs> One of our gulags. Yeah. <laughs> agorist gulags? Oh, fuck. <laughs> so somebody on Twitter accused me of supporting gulags, and I was like, well, I, was I, was like, gonna... I mean, they're, they're going to be full of politicians, though. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sound that bad <laughs> like okay we found our compromise uh, that's that's how we'll win over the left he's like we'll still have gulags don't worry <laughs> in all seriousness though if you think about it it really is the only it's the only logically consistent way it's only it's only way consistent with the non-aggression principle to to uh, get restitution from these people from for all the property crimes they've committed have them work off their debt to us and then 
only if and when they can become rehabilitated can they be released back into general society, you know? Damn, yeah. I've heard of, of this. Yeah, I mean, otherwise <laughs> people, like, they want to... What, what else are you going to do with them? You can either let them go and then let their property crimes go ignored, or you could use violence, and at which point you've become the state. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. <clears throat> you know, if you read, it's an essay by Konkin called That Bread is Mine too. <laughs> Number two, he yes. talks about it in there. Also, um, congressional yeah. labor camps. <laughs> I love the sound of that, right? That sounds great. Um, <laughs> also, Walter Block, I did an episode of the Agora with Walter Block where he, about an article he wrote about slave reparations, where it's just like a purely like retributivist, like sort of uh, attempt at like restoring property to the rightful owner but in a non-violent way that's like purely economical i thought that was pretty good yeah well walter block's like incredible his mind is just on another level than like the rest of us i think <laughs> like yeah walter block when he's not political <laughs> like <the> libertarian <laughs> yeah, for right. libertarians for trump thing was not that great oh christ yes i know Wait, so that? That, that, that's that's quite the uh, quite the difference of opinion <laughs> from <laughs> from one from one topic to the other. How do you? Oof. Yeah, he got into a lot of trouble for that one. I don't know what he was thinking when he said that. <laughs> so, uh, people still manage to get caught up in the uh, in the election years and the political cycle. Like it's it, it's a very good circus, I'll admit, and it, it catches even even the better minds off guard every now and then. Like again, that just like goes back to the whole like ANCAP versus agorist. Mm. Du- like divide because like so walter block's like an avowed anarcho-capitalist you would never see like sam conkin do something like that you know what i mean mm-hmm. in the political game now i mean i lou rockwell and uh, tom tom woods had a series where they were talking about the democratic debate I and mean, they were just making fun of it they had like three or four parts on yeah. tom woods it was fun because they they were having a laugh right but it, it would hear the same podcast, but with Walter Block <laughs> trying to explain <laughs> the libertarians for Trump thing. <laughs> I'm not sure it would be as fun. <laughs> Next time you have him on, Sally, you could trick him. Like, you, not trick him, but you know how you always have, like, that random question to ask him? That's what it right. could be. Like, <laughs> yes. so what was up with that? <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. In, in, in light of the red flag laws, do you still support? Well, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> like, uh, so, so, do you still like uh, civilians having suppressors? Like, is that cool? Or I mean, I he's mean, always he's... like he's always prepared for you, though. He's always got like a comeback. Oh, like, yes. That's like his like thing. That's why he's like so well known. Is like his logical, his wit. You know. I mean, I, I would love to hear a witty comeback on a uh, on a uh, due process second. Right, right. Or even just supporting a presidential candidate in general. Again, that's the mm-hmm. problem with capitalism is that they always fall back to the political means. That's why, like, sometimes, like, I'll say that, uh, I'll be, like, if you think about it, anarcho-capitalism is really just a logically inconsistent variant of agorism. And people are like, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Well, like, if you're out voting, then you're not being consistent. If you're out supporting presidents, you're not being consistent. Mm-hmm. Like even for somebody like Walter Block, like that's an incons- that's an inconsistency in an otherwise, you know, exemplary record. Or like you know, another example is like Hop's support for uh, immigration. I mean, the guy's like a brilliant logician, but you can't be hundred percent perfect all the time. Otherwise, you'd be like Socrates or something. I don't even know. You'd be like God. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> is uh. So, like, I, I guess, like, a common thing that I saw on Instagram is that uh, agorism is just giving up, like... Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, so, you know, the self-proclaimed boog boys, you know, they want to, like, fight tomorrow or yesterday, basically. And when you say, like, the debate is over or something like that, you know, we're not, like, fighting for these things. We're just going to take them, live like we're free today. Um they they say they're just giving it up. What do you guys say? Ask IRA how that worked out. <laughs> I, to me, like I think it's funny because really they're the ones who are giving up, right? If you're if you've resorted to like violence, then you've given up. You've become your enemy, and mm-hmm. like the only 
you, you can't be giving up if you're saying like, I'm going to disregard what the state says. I'm going to, I'm going to be free no matter what, like that, that's one of the biggest draws for me to agorism is that it's not a gradualist approach. It's just like instantly, as soon as you accept agorism as the correct philosophy, then you're free. So like, that's not giving up. That's winning. We've, we've mm-hmm. declared the battle is over. Like the gun control debate is over. Like they can, they can go like march around Virginia all day long and like, you know, sit outside Ralph, Ralph Northam's office begging for his permission all they want. But we're still like running those guns that they say that we can't. So they're, they've given up and we are, we're, we're already free. We've won. Mm-hmm. Like, over. The agorists have already won, you know? Yeah, that, that is an, an important note. Um, living on your own terms rather than being like, well, if we prepare to do this, then we can push towards being free rather than just living freely and doing your best to, I mean, to, to do that in every way you can. Sounds like they're giving up, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. sounds like no, they're no. like I, I've I've never uh never turned it around like that. And that, yeah, very fucking solid point. It's like a lot of can kicking, like, you know, we're we are where we are right now, despite our history. There's been a whole lot of giving up by some people. <laughs> well, it's like remember that meme? It's like a really I'm sure you've probably seen it. It's like the the gun rights groups and they just keep constantly they they're just like stepping back oh, drawing the line yeah. and they're mm-hmm. like well you better not cross it this time and it's like well so like they've already murdered the weaver family they've burned like 60 some odd children alive to death so <clears throat> where what like what is the line at this point like they've taken your bump stocks they've taken your you know where 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 do you guys draw the line like they're not okay. they're not going to start it. it's a good thing they don't well the, the thing that's really um kind of the nail in the coffin for that kind of uh energy is even when you win it it just you just start over again you just restart on the cycle Mm because i I mean the american revolutionaries they won they got their liberty and now we live in under the the biggest state in the world the most powerful and arguably one of the most impressive they were like George Washington was out collecting taxes like a week later. So I mean, there was like, yeah, like a revolution. You, know? like, you boys enjoying your freedom? Uh, yeah, it was really fucking expensive. So yeah, <laughs> free now. Give me your tax on your whiskey. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I do, I do see merit in in you know showing off that the people are armed and stuff. And I, I think there are people who have the right uh, notion in these marches, like, going out and publicly, like, the people are armed, like, quit moving, and, and like we were saying earlier in the show, uh, like, Carl brought up, that provides us more time to, um, to further this message and to, to, uh, do more counter-economic, um, action, but at the same time, seeing, um, a violent revolution as the end goal is where you start losing, where you do start giving up, um, because so many people, they, they even struggle with the non-aggression principle. And it's like, well, what are we even doing if violence is permissible, but then we're also pissed off with the state for being violent? Like, that's our chief complaint, is that they can only achieve uh, their means through violence. And then we're like, well, our solution, guess what? It's really genius, is violence. (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, a a lot of people mistake my name, Bloody Revolutions, for being like, yeah, let's, let's do this thing. But... In reality, the the song, the crass song that I'm um, named my account after, is a sarcastic, like it, it's it's sarcastic bitching about um, the good of a violent revolution. It, it just being exactly the same as the people who came before us. You know, I like, mean, <clears throat> like the other thing too is that like, and I, like I hate for um, I hate for like Mel to prove me wrong here because she probably might, <laughs> but um, we're not. There's a difference between like pacifism and like normal agorism like we believe like you can like defend property we believe in property right so i mean we're not like saying like you know go out and like walk all over people or anything like that like you can stand up for yourself that's that's perfectly fine and especially like in like the fourth phase of the agorist revolution like conkin writes about how central of a role uh private defense agencies will pay and all will, will play and also like the agorist gulags, quote unquote, that we spoke about, they'll also be privatized. Also, like Bob Murphy's chaos theory speaks about like private, uh, private insurance companies employing private militaries and things like that. So 
there will be like there is violence in the agrarian society, but there's not there's no monopoly on violence. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can get to like a more pacifist society. I would be interested. I would be interested in that, but I don't know how like like what the mechanics of that would look like. I don't know how it is in is in the states, but here in Norway, there are more private security guards than there are cops. Oh, Lucky, beautiful. I mm-hmm. would. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you've got uh, fishing pigs, but at least you have have more private security. <laughs> so, I mean, you win some, you lose some. New York City <laughs> is like in like a literal standing army. We have pigs oh, on yeah. like pigs like on every corner with like AR-15s and AKs, but like and they're in like camo. Like it's bad around here. It's real bad. Oh, that's that's some uh, some Russian shit. Like when I I, yeah. I visited I visited Red Square like just off of Ukraine kicked off, and there was like fucking like six. Six six guys walking around in Spetsnaz camo with with regular cops, and you're like, oh cool, oh, oh yeah, that's like, god, it's Grand Central Station on an average day. Jesus Christ, which is which is funny because it's like, well, I guess they I guess they understand that gun free zones aren't a positive thing. They just want to be the ones with the guns. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, to address the Boogaloo boys, if uh, the state co- are coming for you, you weren't hiding your business good enough. It's like <laughs> if, you, if you have if you have a front door, right, and you have no locks on it, anybody can go in. If you have a lock on it, then some you need tools to get in. Then you have some apps and <laughs> like um, security cameras and a dog stuff like that. You you have to build layers of security between your, yourself and whoever was going to get into your business. Most of the time, it's the state that's going to get into your business, and it's very predictable how they will do stuff. So just avoid it, oh, yeah. avoid showing this in your, your full hand, so to, so to speak. Op- OPSEC is the, key. Yeah. A bit harder first, with red flag laws and stuff like that. The first way to uh, to help them out is to fill out Form 4473. I mean, <laughs> if, you're, if you're going to fill out one of those, you're just like, yeah, come and find me. Like Exactly. That's the whole thing. It's like, why would you do that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I uh I made the mistake when I first got to the US. I've already fucked myself. But since since then I've learned and uh <clears throat> let's say the quantity of firearms I own is not quite uh on the record. So um and and, and more people need to like qu- just quit fucking like w- new shiny gun gets released. Don't go down to the gun store to get it. Like wait a month for someone to get bored of their new range toy and buy it in a private sale, you know? Like, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and, then, yeah. and then lose it in a boating accident. Well, of course. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, just, they're just like water is a magnet for firearms. It's fucking terrifying. <laughs> I don't even turn the tap on without having all my stuff locked away. Um, <laughs> it, it's freaky, really. I've lost all of my firearms in water. Actually, it's I'm funny. Sorry to hear that. <clears throat> I, I remember <laughs> you guys might remember reading there was an article about some guy who actually did hide like, <laughs> all of his guns in like the bottom of a pond next to his house. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> What are you doing, man? <laughs> like, that's the first place I look. <laughs> you <Yeah. You're> cool. <laughs> um, so, Sal, you mentioned earlier the uh, the fourth phase of the agorist revolution. Um, would you mind going over the uh, like all of the phases for us, for our listeners? Sure. Yeah. There's phase one through four, and uh, you know it starts off in a completely status dominated society, and then it you know, gradually transitions into what Konkin calls the Agora, or is just like pure economics and the lack of politics. It's a society that lacks any politics whatsoever and only has economics. So those four phases are like, there's two intermediary phases and then the two bookends. Um, Each one will be like marked by like increases in freedom. So like stage three is like when he says you'll start to see some semblance of like parity between the state and the the counter economy. So I think like it's really important to like stress people like Dale Brown in Michigan um, with the Detroit threat management. And there's, there's some other alternatives to policing, but like any infrastructure Mm -hmm. alternatives that are out there, I think it's a really good idea for us to like stress because that is how we're going to get into I mean, I think right now we're in like the second phase, maybe, I think. I mean, I guess it's subjective. It seems to me like we're in the second phase of the revolution and we're trying to get into the third phase, which I think we're kind of like making progress getting there. And then eventually, like, 
when we have private, uh, you know, a more dominant private police and insurance companies and private courts, when like they start to reach the size of like Amazon's and Microsoft's and Facebook's, <laughs> then like it'll be really difficult for them to for like the state to keep their head above water. And then you'll start to see like the rats will flee like a sinking ship. So like <laughs> you'll have like a mosh and Massey will be like the first to bail and probably like Tulsi Gabbard and eventually like all the way down to like the Chuck Schumer's and Nancy Pelosi's will have no choice but to come into our camps, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's really crazy how um, a lot of like the talking points for prison abolition and like police abolition are super agor- agorist. Um, like you were talking about with like the thing in Detroit and I think maybe in New York, one of the Jewish communities, they have their own police, right? Yes. In Brooklyn. And then um, just like, helping your neighbors learn self-defense and like phone trees. So like, instead of calling the police for wellness checks, you call like your neighbor or your friend. No, it's true. Um, There's, I don't know if you guys are, do you guys know like the don't comply crew in Texas? They're like a bunch of agorists who are, they do incredible, incredible work in Texas. Like every, every, yeah, it really is incredible what they do. Uh, Shout out to them. But like, um, they're like they had some app that they were promoting for a while i haven't heard them talk about in a while but it was like like a phone tree basically what you're saying instead of calling the police like fall back onto the community like horizontal Mm -hmm. economics rely on like those who like who you know who you like you trust like in a voluntary voluntary way i dig it it's amazing that's uh you you see that in a lot like when you um all of anarchist issues and subsequently uh, agorist issues they they generally fall back to um, counter-economic kind of solutions being the the consistent end all to it. Like I mean, like we're talking about gun control, uh, 3D printing and stuff. I mean, once you once you completely take out of their control, that's when you you're actually going to be able to be effective at uh, countering them. Um, and that, that's you you can go the anarcho-capitalist route, but usually you come to something where you're going to be sidestepping the state rather than like you know providing an alternative. It's uh, it's something that's actively hurting them more than just um. Well, here's my solution, you know, and uh, hey, like, and, and so I was just gonna say, like, when you when you like when you like question their monopoly on violence, then like they get they get a lot more serious. Like at that point, you can either your your choices as a libertarian are you can either comply with the state and be like a little slave. Or you can be a radical agorist, and those—it's a binary choice. There's no like middle ground there. Yeah, uh, that's that's something. Um, like you guys were saying earlier, a lot of people they don't know they're agorists, but they're they're practicing um, agorism in their in their everyday life, the way they sidestep things. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and the more you learn about this, it's not like uh, I, I I guess it is choosing a side in a way, but really it's just it's just becoming consistent, uh, choosing to practice more agorism and. And doing as much as you can to uh, harm the state's monopoly in any way you can. Really, um, just like surviving in general. Um, yeah. Like, like uh, Mel just mentioned, like the Jewish community and how they have like alternatives to policing. There was a yeah. case here. I don't know if it was last year or six months ago, where because um, there is a lot of like racial violence between like the black and Jewish communities here, for whatever reason. Like it goes back a long time, but uh, they had actually. There was a, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but it's true. There was a hero on the NYPD who was, uh, I guess he was like in charge of handing out gun licenses. And I guess like his standing orders were don't give out any gun licenses to anybody. That's what um, the slave master here, Bill de Blasio, ordered him to do. So he was doing under the table for like money. And like he was giving out a lot of people had like, legitimate gun licenses because of like what this guy did but like it was all driven by the state's inability to uh, provide security they had this monopoly on violence but they weren't able to use it effectively so the counter counter economy provided you know that's awesome if we want to start getting into like a few wrapping up questions mel unless you've got any major like long topics (laughs) uh somebody asked Farmers be stripped of their property and nonprofits. When the agorist revolution is complete, 
there is a lot of cities that has looted a lot of tax money and solution to the, those. It's a very complicated <laughs> legal <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, we believe in private property rights and it makes things so messy, right? Because I don't know what is subsidized or 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 not and when I purchase something and who is gaining from that and stuff like that. And you have a lot of farmers in um, it's and here in Europe that relies on um, money from the state to to sustain, and it's very very hard to know if it's their business models that is so shit, so they had need uh, handouts from the state to survive, or if the state has taxed them and regulated them to death, so they have to produce in a very narrow sense, like to comply with state regulations and try to save with taxes. So it's very hard to to, to balance that uh, that sheet, right? Uh, how many pluses and minuses do you have? <laughs> very very complicated, and um, and then and you have the second second problem, like who is going to get the property if we're if we find someone who is like tax funded and he's just moving cow, cows around and he gets money from the state? Who is going to who? who how do we divide up the the property? Uh, Above above my pay grade to figure out those kind of stuff, <laughs> right? So it's somebody get Walter Block on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even like, think uh, good good old Walter knows how to do it. I I think like if I remember that question that you guys were talking about, I think like they were. It almost seemed to me like they were trying to goad us into like saying like, oh, we're going to take property from these poor farmers and stuff like that. But it's like they stole it. This isn't this isn't their property. They're in receipt of stolen property. A subsidy is stolen property. So that's not the farmer's property. So like, yeah, we're going to take their property and give it back to the rightful owner. That's that that's what you do in a <laughs> society based in property rights and in an actually civilized society where people aren't robbed at gunpoint to pay the farmers. <laughs> like I don't understand why that difficult to understand. Yes, we're going to take everything that was stolen by anybody. Even if it was like a priest or your local pastor, whatever they stole is going to be put back into the hands of its rightful owner. Like, mm-hmm. I, I guess where it gets particularly messy is when, um, like, honestly, earned money is then mixed with subsidies. Like, so I don't know, like uh, a a rightfully family-owned farm might have been heavily subsidized, and then like, at what point does it become like it's basically state property has been so heavily subsidized, or like when is it? you know, lightly subsidized, you know, I, I... If the farm, in this case, uh, uh, only had a very bad business model, so they wouldn't survive without uh, subsidies, then mm. we don't have to do anything. Then, then the farm would collapse and we can move in and home right. after, mm-hmm. after they, the owners are gone. It'll work so, itself out. Yeah. And if, if they have a good business model and they got subsidies, yes, because the state regulated them <laughs> likes to give away people's money <laughs> that direction then these these are farmers right so they can serve the society better by producing goods that we want mm-hmm. and i mean i if if uh, if if some norwegian farmer gets so much subsidies so from from me that i i'll, I'll get this tractor for example but I'm, what am i going to do with this tractor <laughs> it, it it would uh, serve me better if he kept the tractor and it produced stuff that for the market i think I like get, also <clears throat> go ahead alex i'm sorry of course i get high quality sheep stuff that i can buy instead of having a tractor and nothing <laughs> nothing to do with it and nothing no produce to buy that's my take on it i mean arming arming people and then taking farms from people is not particularly efficient especially when you have to cut up cut up the property and do stuff with it mm-hmm. And it's like we were saying, just a continuation of the way the state operates, which is kind of counterproductive to what we want. The proletarian re- uh, revolution in the communist countries are usually like that. Yeah. <laughs> Always ends bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, apparently it's it's the way to go if I if I look at lefty Twitter, but um, that's another <laughs> that's another conversation. Um, I, well, I've got I've got I think one more solid one to kind of wrap up on, and that is, um, do you guys think we will reach the Agora within our lifetimes? We do a level, yes. 
there are people who is doing it on an individual level where they are trading within their circle and uh, keep it free and then they eventually have to uh, wander outside their own agora because they they can't produce everything themselves like a laptop is very hard if you're just community you need to interact with state world markets eventually but hopefully we will have specialists that can do everything in a network yeah. it's going to be very hard to do it in a local uh, very very locally but internationally i i can see it especially when drone technology gets better <clears throat> sure i think that's really important too and I, I think that's something that we haven't really touched on but that's that's actually i think is going to be huge I, I i generally do agree with with alex i'm not i'm really optimistic that it's going to happen i don't know if it'll happen within our lifetime but like I'm like completely sold in the idea that it's going to happen. It's a matter of time. Like I, I really believe yeah. it's going to happen because it's, it is the only logically consistent way that I can think of like the whole political economy. I hope it happens in our moving lifetime. Physical goods, moving physical goods is a very hard, moving physical goods is a very hard thing to do right now because the borders are straight controlled. But once you figure out that part, then it's a lot easier. And, um, we are living very patchy. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna tokenize everything so we can just send it right across the border without any physical good ever crossing. I think a really good book to help you feel optimistic is the Sovereign Individual. Um, Sal, do you remember the author? Authors, dual authors. No, I don't. My phone's off, so I can't even open my Audible app. It was actually really incredible. R- ramble for two more seconds, and I'll have it. Uh... James Dale Davidson and, and Lord William Rees Mogg. Wait, wait. William Rees Mogg, really? Huh. What's going on? Oh, he's just a, he's just a semi-popular conservative figure in Britain. I, I didn't realize he would have uh, wrote anything relevant to us. Go he Mogg. predicted Bitcoin and... In the 90s. <laughs> what the f- I did not know that. Well, shit. Man's, uh... I knew the man was clever, but he just has some interesting uh, opinions here and there. I never finished it, but, like, if you just, like, give, like, the first, like, like, the first couple hours, give it, give it a listen. <clears throat> you mm-hmm. won't know. Uh, you definitely won't be disappointed. They discuss how, like, back in the day, <laughs> the, the church used to be, like, as pervasive as the state is now, and people thought it would never come to an end. And... Mm. One day it just became hard to sustain, you know, like our government. It's not productive. It sucks out a lot of the productivity and they just got real sick of it. And there goes the church. Um, the book basically talks about how technology is going to make individuals very competitive with the state. And that'll be their downfall. <laughs> yeah. It's already happening. Um, mm-hmm. Like we start to see like the empowerment of the individual with things like, I hate to sound like a broken record, but like Bitcoin and 3D printing and like tokenization and stuff like that. Like we're empowering the individual at the expense of the state. Like even even when it's not the state, like even when it's a corporation, we're, we're breaking it down to even more individualized levels. Like instead of Facebook uh, profiting off of your content, now you, we tokenize it and you profit on mines, for example. You you have the profit. So it's like we keep like trying to draw it down to a more individualized level. That's why uh, Konkin was anti-wage labor as well, because right. during his lifetime it was kind of tricky. You couldn't set up a factory in your like you can now, but he's always, he, I think he foresaw where it was heading. Also, the entrepreneur is in a better position to evade taxation than, you know, someone who has their social security withholding automatically deducted from their paycheck every Friday or something like that. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, what is it called? Independent contractor and uh, freelancing is much, much more common now and with uh, ideas like sharing economy and those kind of applications like uber and stuff you can see where it's heading uh i can go on a local uh, facebook group and get a untaxed taxi right now if i want you know in um in theory of socialism and capitalism hans hoppe talks about how uh 
um, like the feudal societies came to an end because merchants were traveling across borders, so they weren't really beholden to any particular state. And nowadays, because of technology, we see like this so-called digital nomads who uh, work from their computer, but they can live anywhere in the world. And I think that I wouldn't be surprised if like all of these different decentralizing forces like combine to just apply such a high degree of pressure on the state that they just can't stand it anymore and just collapse uh, from something similar to what like Hop was talking about. Um, uh, it's similar with uh, Sil- the old Silk Road, not uh, uh, Ross Albrecht's Silk Road, but the old uh, older one in the space. <laughs> uh, because the Ara- Ara- Arabic uh, merchants uh, in the um, Middle East and uh, Northern Africa, they figured out that if everybody could trade with everybody, then everybody was going to become richer. So they mm. removed a lot of restrictions and stuff like that. And then the merchants hit Europe, like France and England was, and Spain was big uh, trading spots. But there, only the royalties and the blue bloods was uh, rich enough to buy their goods. So they, <laughs> so they uh, was trying to bargain with... Uh, with the European royals to loosen up on regulations and allow the peasants to become uh, richer, so they so they had more customers to sell the goods to. Because how much uh, saffron or silk can a royal house buy? Not not enough to make it profitable to, to go all the way to Europe. Market always wins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can't really sustain something that is uh, that only steals. You can only really sustain something that's. Uh productive i mean something that's a leech it's it's always going to have a expiration date as as history has proven exactly um anyone have any sort of final notes buy bitcoin uh buy bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> buy bitcoin sweet um consume less. You know? <laughs> consume less yes um that, that's that's a an important note i mean corporations are uh, much of the time, an extension of the state. I mean, when, when they get so big um, that they're, you know, that they're paying millions in uh, in tax, and and uh, when they're the ones harming the individual by lobbying um, for the the legislation that restricts your your liberties and and your choice and and kills competition, which ultimately harms the individual. Um, the less you support them, I mean, the less you're supporting your, the uh, the government as well. And no. And yeah, I, would, I would second that 100%. Um, that's said better than I could ever say it. That's why, like I said, I, um, you know, I look forward to hyper individualization and decentralization so that we can mm-hmm. sort of sort of dethrone these, uh, you know, tech CEOs who are really in bed with Congress and Senate and the senators and stuff like that. And they're the ones funding the warfare welfare states. So decentralization for the win. Yeah, absolutely. I, so many people say, um, I mean, a, a free society will be a bunch of mega corporations dominating us. But I mean, can you can you really compete with the individual uh, constantly, like undercutting you, your your prices and and your service and your quality and all and and you know your local culture and stuff um, without the uh, monopoly on violence and and such. And moreover, just real quick, like <clears throat> if a if they if they do grow to such a huge size, then they had to do so out of benevolence because they were able to provide a good or a service that everybody wanted, and not because yeah. they bribed mm-hmm. the right senator. You know, yeah, they have yeah. to be uh, socially interact interacting. They can't just send the thugs over and like they can now. Like exactly, the big pharma they can't compete with a kid with a lab, a lab kit. <laughs> Price <laughs> it's that impossible. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Um, lastly, <laughs> uh, what are some good reading materials for aspiring agorists? Um, Alex, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, what, 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 well, uh, I want to the search for personal freedom. You can, uh, buy, you can buy it from Liberty Under the, Under, under Attack and you can Buy it from Amazon, and you can listen to it on YouTube. That's Vanu, V-O-N-U. The search for search for personal freedom. It's a really good good book. It's from the seventies, I think. Uh, a bit more 
strategic in its approach, and I really like that one. And then Guerrilla Gardening is a second book I could suggest that it's really, that book really impressed me, and it's very hard to not be a revolutionary after that one. <laughs> <laughs> revolutionary, that plants flowers and stuff. <laughs> the best kind. That's my um, two two choices. There is a lot of cool books out there, but that's that's my top two right now. If I have to, if I have to keep, to, I have to stick to two. I'd probably say the New Libertarian Manifesto and Community Technology. Mm-hmm. Like the, I like those both books too, but I think Libertarian Manifesto should be mandatory. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> community like Technology also, like, is so good, so good. Because uh, Carl Hess explains the process uh, as it happens, right through the book. So it's and it's very healthy to see that kind of positive. I'll spoil the whole book, but <laughs> it's a little it's, harder to find, uh, but it's out there. Oh yeah, it's, it's hard to find. It's expensive sometimes when they do have it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, loot is a book for two hundred dollars. So <laughs> wow, <laughs> sucked, <laughs> but. But it's in my library now. So. Um, I think uh, the Perb Island article, a strategy for pushing back. Yes. I think, yep, a strategy for pushing back the state. That's a really good one. I really just go to sck3.net and peruse some of the writings by Conk in there. And also, like, alongside Knight, like, anything by Gene Neal Shulman um, is, like, really good. Uh, anything by Rothbard, obviously. Mm-hmm. A Market for Liberty by the Tam Hills is pretty good, too. Get some of the basics down. That's currently There's on my book. pile. <laughs> from There's a book, called, uh, book called Hashtag Agora. That's really good. Oh, man, you guys are destroying my reading list right now. Hashtag <laughs> <laughs> Agora, it's free. Well, that's, uh, that's a lot of homework for the viewers, but um, <laughs> it will all pay off, I'm sure. Um. Yeah, I, I guess we uh, we can wrap up. Thanks for having thank us. You. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, you for so coming much on. for coming. I, on. I uh, I've I've been sitting here learning, which is kind of why I sound like I'm uh, I'm about five minutes behind everyone. I'm uh, I'm brand new to sort of calling myself an agorist. I'm very 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 early days, but um, seeing the consistency, uh, it, as opposed to anarcho capitalism, and 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 seeing the value in doing something today rather than preparing for something that may never come i mean there's just it, it's just practical it's it's not giving up it's as we said uh engaging in something right now and uh that that's something we're all interested in uh actually practical solutions rather than uh you know, so-called utopian ones um and and yeah i think this is going to be valuable for a lot of people who are frustrated seeing um when things are far away rather than within their grasp and agorism is you can do something right now so uh yeah thank you guys for uh explaining it um coming on and <laughs> explaining it like we're five <laughs> <laughs> definitely needed oh thank thank you guys for all you do and like i love this show you guys and like it's a great tool to get the message out there and you guys are both like excellent spokespeople for agorism so keep it up thank you cheers man all right um thanks for listening guys we'll see you next time